I saw a poster outside today advertising the full Monty. I'm a bit scared that you think that any moment I might take my clothes off. I promise I'm not going to do that. But I would like you to close your eyes for a moment, please, and open them, open them again now. I want you to imagine that you've just regained consciousness. There's a small needle prick in your arm where they put the needle in, but you don't remember it. In fact, the drug is so powerful that you remember nothing at all. Your memory has been completely erased. Everyone else in the room also has a little needle mark. None of us can remember anything except, for the sake of argument, how to speak English. Imagine that the doors are um, locked closed, the windows are boarded up. Here we are in this room with no memory whatsoever of how we got here. But being curious types, we're going to start asking fundamental questions about the nature of reality. So, what are we doing here in this room? Where do we come from? Is it ever possible to leave this room? And in, in which case, where would we go? Is there anything beyond what we see and hear in this room? How should we behave while we're in the room? What is life in the room for? Fundamental questions, but no answers because none of us can remember. But some people um, decide to take the scientific route and they say, let's work out uh, what we can find out by experiments. So maybe they take some chairs and they drop them from various heights and they time the, uh, the interval between dropping the chair and it crashing on the floor. Uh, and, the, and they calculate the acceleration due to gravity in this room is 9.81 meters per second per second. Um, other people take it a stage further, they go into a biological angle and they drop the same chairs but this time on people's feet and they notice this elicits a yelp of pain and they time the interval in between the, the chair arriving on the foot and the cry of pain and they formulate a theory about uh, nerve cells and action potentials and how quickly they travel um, from your toe to your voice box. Other people, um, being sociologists, Notice that the people on whose feet the chairs are dropped become really quite upset with the scientists who are dropping the chairs and some conflict breaks out and they, they, they formulate a theory of ethics and the sort of way in which we ought to behave towards one another while we're trying to find out about life in the room. So simply by observing life here we can find out about gravity um, and biology and ethics. But when it comes to life beyond the room those people say, well look, by definition we can't access it or measure it, so let's just assume that this room is all that there is. Other people take a, a different approach. They have um, too many olives to eat and they fall into an olive-induced tapenade dream. And in their dream they have this um, vivid vision and they, they regain consciousness and they say, oh, um, during my dream I, I pictured this great big olive and I think I've come in touch with reality. We're all part of one giant olive in the sky. Um, and some people are persuaded by their charismatic personality and their vivid dream. And the olive tapenade movement begins. And some of you follow it. Um, others are less convinced. Then at that moment, there's the sound of a key turning in a lock. And someone walks in from the door over there. Actually, they're from the Harpenden police. And they say, it's obvious what's happened here. You've come to big questions organised by that notorious church, Christchurch. They've drugged you all. Get out now. Um, now, um, silly thought experiment. It's obvious though, isn't it, in that scenario, that what the person says who's come through the door from outside uh, trumps everything that we could find out ourselves. It wasn't that the experiments were invalid, found out useful things about gravity and about nerve cells. Um, it wasn't that our dreams were, well actually the dream was a bit crazy, but this person objectively knows about life beyond this room. They say you're in this town called Harpenden. Uh, they tell you there's a church called Christ Church that brought you here. There's posters outside for the full Monty, etc, etc. Now, what that person has to say just extends further than our experiments and our guesses. The person from outside um, has real facts to share with us. Well, maybe you'll see where I'm going with this. That's a bit of an analogy for life in this world. Instead of the room, imagine the world, the cosmos. The same big questions. What are we doing here? How do we get here? Could we ever leave? Where would we go to? What's life for? 
the same kind of attempts at answers. Maybe we can do experiments to find out. Maybe we can have visions to try and connect with something within us. But no ultimate certainty concerning issues that are beyond our own perception. But what if 2,000 years ago somebody opened the door and stepped into our world from outside? What if that person, um, Jesus Christ, actually made this world? He knows the secrets of where it came from and where it's going and what life is for and why we're here. It seems obvious to me that if that's true, in, in other words, if he really did come from outside, if he really is the creator, he would know more than we would know and that we could find out or measure or guess. And that revelation from outside would be a complete game changer. The question tonight is how can we know God exists? And my answer is going to be we can know God exists because God stepped into history 2,000 years ago, the person of Jesus Christ. For me, that was a game changer. When I was at, at university, as a skeptic in my first year, I thought Christianity, fundamentally, was an aesthetic. You know, it was a kind of, um, if you're into stained glass windows and organ music, which I wasn't particularly, then it's for you. And, you know, if that isn't your thing, then it isn't for you. It's just a kind of experience, like going to the opera or the ballet or going to watch a, a judo match or, you know, whatever is your thing. Um, or I thought maybe it was an ethic, it was just a way of living that some people found helpful and I partly did and I partly disagreed with it. When I realised it was about a claim in history 2,000 years ago that somebody walked into the world who it was said was God who made the world, this man was called Jesus Christ, he lived during the Roman occupation of Israel in the first century. I realised that it was an objective thing. It was a, a true or not true for everyone thing. Because unlike aesthetics, unlike ethics, um, history either happened or it didn't happen. You know, imagine um, Battle of Hastings 1066, and I say, oh, I'm not really a um, Norman Kent Conquest kind of person. Oh, who cares? It still happened in 1066. Or I said, oh, for me, I prefer to think of the Battle of Hastings as happening between um, England and Australia in 1166. Well, I would fail my history GCSE because it didn't. It happened between France and England in 1066. It's, it, it's objectively true or not true, and it doesn't depend on me. It depends on that, what happened, what actually happened. It's, it's checkable and it's objective. And I thought, I need to know the answer. What happened 2,000 years ago? Either Jesus Christ existed or didn't exist. Um, he was either a con man or he was telling the truth. He was either an ordinary human being or he was a human being who also made the world because he was the God who created us. And one of those things, and only one of those things, could be true. Well, you say, okay, fair enough, I get the concept. The trouble is, I wasn't there 2,000 years ago when the door is supposed to have opened and someone's supposed to have walked through it. And that, that's true, we weren't. But other people were there, and this little booklet um, contains the testimony of lots of people who met him, who were there, who lived at the same time. And I want to spend quite a lot of my time persuading you to read this. Now, maybe at the moment you're thinking, I don't really want to, and maybe at the end you say, I don't really want to, but my aim is going to be, my big aim for tonight, is to persuade you that this is worth reading and that you ought to set aside some time in the next week to seriously study it. But for now, just grab a copy, it's on your, on your tables. Uh, this is a, a translation into English of a, a manuscript originally written in the Greek language um, by a man called Luke, who was a doctor, writing in the first century about this claim that God visited the world. We can know about God because he stepped through the door of history. And I want you to notice, he is not interested just in aesthetics. You know, are you into the idea of a God? That, that's not his interest. And nor is he interested only in ethics, how should you live? He's interested in what actually happened in history. Just, just look with me at the first page, just one page in, uh, where it says introduction. He writes this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled amongst us 
just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. That was a very surprising way, for, for me at least, when I came to the Bible, it's a very surprising way for a book of the Bible to begin. I thought it was going to be, here are some lovely ideas um, through raised into spectacles that you ought to believe by a leap in the dark. Instead, somebody says, I've investigated all the facts from the eyewitnesses and I want you to be certain. Not even, I, I want you to sort of have a, a hunch or, or a faith that you sort of blindly follow. I want you to be certain on the basis of the facts. How, how surprising. Now, um, of course, some people sniff at eyewitness testimony. So, um, recently, Barnaby mentioned that I appeared on the BBC. But very briefly, I was interviewed um, along with Peter Atkins, the Oxford professor who's a, an outspoken atheist, and we had the chance to go head to head. And Peter Atkins made this extraordinary claim, I thought. He said, we shouldn't accept anything in life that hasn't been proven by scientific experiments. It's irrational to believe in anything that you haven't proven by experiment. I thought that was a bizarre thing to say. And I, and I, um, I went to ask him, um, excuse me, um, Professor Atkins, can you tell me who spoke on this podium just before you did? And you know, there were about um, 300 witnesses there, and we all knew the answer, and he knew the answer. So he would have told us, all, it was so-and-so, well, yes, but you haven't proved that by scientific experiment. You can't do an experiment to prove who was at the, the podium. But you know who was there because you saw it and we all saw it. I mean, eyewitness evidence is, is actually pretty strong evidence. About a few years ago, um, I was arrested. And the church that invited me here doesn't, doesn't know this, but I was. And um, what, don't worry, it's going to be okay. Um, what happened was, it was an unpleasant situation, actually. There was a, just outside our church in the city of London, um, there was a, a kind of road rage incident with a, a truck driver screeched up on the pavement to get past an elderly man from our church who was reversing quite slowly. And very impatient and almost scraped the car. And I, I was quite disgusted by his behaviour. I just walked over to say, mate, that's not, not really on. And he told me to F off, etc, etc. And anyway, I thought, fair enough, um, I'll walk away from this. And I, I cycled off and the guy chased me in his van. And we got to quite a quiet street around the corner and he overtook me and parked his van in front of my bike, got out um, the, the van and pushed me to the floor um, and was about to beat me up. And fortunately, um, somebody came along at that moment, pedestrian and a security guard in a building just nearby, and it all stopped. And the police arrived and, and they said, what's happened? And I said, well, I was assaulted. And he said, I was assaulted. This is a priori slightly less likely, isn't it, that a, a cyclist has successfully assaulted someone driving a van. But anyway, that's his claim. And so they arrested both of us. Went off to the police station. I was quite shaken. Um, but I was released about half an hour later, and he was um, convicted in court, because there were people there who saw what happened. Now, uh, the magistrates, three of them, they weren't there, but they reached their verdict and found him guilty on the basis of witnesses. You live in a country where eyewitness evidence is considered powerful enough and reliable enough to put somebody away in, in prison because it's very good evidence and Luke knows that and it's on the basis of what happened that he wants Theophilus, his reader, and us, his readers, to be certain. Well, fair enough, you think, but how do I know that he didn't just make it up? Maybe this is just a fairy story concocted by Luke to persuade us about somebody walking through the door of history from the outside. Two things to say. Firstly, I don't think this is the story that you would make up. By which I mean, if you were trying to invent a religion, and of course lots of people have done that over the years, but if you wanted to make up a religion, you could do a whole lot better than this. This is not the one that you'd make up. There's just too many gaffes in it, you know, that are just not going to help. So, for example, you don't have to turn to it now, but on page 42, we discover that Jesus' best friends are tax collectors and sinners. Uh, in other words, the, the morally dubious people. Um, you need to know the background. Um, Israel was an occupied country. The Roman soldiers um, walked the streets. 
Uh, people hated the occupation, like most occupied countries, but particularly they hated tax collectors who were Jewish people working for the enemy. They were taxing their own people on behalf of their oppressors. They were the least popular people in society. They were the equivalent, I guess, of the paedophile in our society. And they loved Jesus and he accepted them. Uh, two of his closest friends in this, in this book, um, a man called Levi, a man called Zacchaeus, both tax collectors. That is not a good idea, is it? If you're trying to make up a religion, don't make the heroes of the religion the people that everyone considers morally unscrupulous, the lowest of the low. It's not going to give you credibility. Don't make up that. It gets worse, though. Um, the, the leader of the early church, a guy called Peter, St. Peter, uh, we read on page 58 of this book that when Jesus was on trial for his life, um, Peter was just following at a distance and got quizzed by a servant girl. Do you know, do you know this guy, Jesus? Are you, are you one of his people? And he's such a coward that he denies that he knows his best friend um, three times. I've ne I've never, I don't know who you're talking about. I've never met him before. And he breaks down in tears. He's a coward. He's a failure. I mean, that, that's not a good idea, is it? If you're making up a movement, at least give credibility to your leader. We know how important that is in politics. But this leader is weak and failure, failure. But it's all in here. It's not rose-tinted or how strange. It, it gets worse, though. By the time you get to page 61, you find that Jesus Christ, the one that they thought might be God, is now being executed on a Roman cross. He's being crucified. Now, this is a huge problem. Uh, we know that this was a massive stumbling block in the early centuries to people becoming Christians. So, um, Jewish people, there's a, um, a, hi a historical uh, source from a guy called Justin Martyr in the second century describing his conversations with a Jewish friend and his Jewish friend, a guy called Trypho, says, I absolutely cannot believe that this Jesus is the Messiah because God would never let his, his king be executed in such a shameful way. Now, God would never let his king be, be hung on a cross, hung on a tree like this. A major obstacle. In the same way as Muslims can't believe that Jesus was crucified. They don't believe that he was. If he was a prophet, God would never let a prophet die in that kind of way. Huge problem for Jews. Huge problem for, um, for Romans. There's a piece of graffiti that was uncovered in the excavations of Caligula's palace in Rome in the 3rd century. Um, and it just depicts a, a Christian bowing before somebody on a cross with a donkey's head. And the inscription reads, Alexamenos worships his God. You can look it up on Google, just type in Alexamenos and you'll find the picture. As if to say, how stupid and what an idiot to worship somebody who died in a weak, criminal way. Massive obstacle. Don't, don't have your king die like this. Have him be a great victor. Have him celebrated in a great conquest. Don't let him be die, die in weakness. And then, well, there is one consolation, I suppose. He dies, but then he comes back to life at the end of this book. Right? So, okay, fair enough. But again, it's a disaster because the witnesses, the first people to arrive at the scene, at the tomb, where his body was laid, now empty because he's gone, the first witnesses of the empty tomb are women. Now, in our enlightened society, we don't mind that, that's fair enough. Uh, you can trust a woman's testimony just as much as a man's, we think. But that wasn't the case in the first century. People didn't trust women's testimony. And it was considered inadmissible in court. Quite a sexist sort of um, statement. And we're told that when the women went to report their story, people didn't believe them. Their words seemed like nonsense. Don't make the key witnesses to the key event women. If you're making it up, you can do better than this. Unless, of course, this is what happened. Unless Jesus was popular with the tax collectors and the sinners. Peter, the, the founder of the early church, maybe he was a coward who denied Jesus. And he just wanted to be honest about that. Maybe Jesus was crucified on a cross, but then came back to life. Maybe the people who actually saw it were women. And Luke is doing what he says he was doing, investigating everything from the eyewitnesses and writing down what happened, so we could be sure. It's not the story you'd make up. Secondly, and more briefly, it's not the story that you could make up. I don't think you could get away with making this up. And the reason is that we all know the best fairy stories, they start long, long ago, far, far away. That's how you start a fairy story. And you might say, well, it was long ago and far away. It was in Israel and it was 2,000 years ago. Yeah, sure, it was for us, but for the first readers, it was local 
and recent. Uh, the message of Christianity began to be proclaimed publicly in a gathering like this just a month after the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. Lots of people in the city of Jerusalem who were there. You make up a fairy story. It's very dangerous, isn't it, to name names. Just, just make it general. Just tell us there was somebody in a town somewhere and Jesus helped them in a really special way. Don't tell us what they're called and where they live because we can check if we're sceptical about it. Don't tell us there was a guy called Jairus whose daughter was dead and Jesus raised her from the dead. It's a great fairy story, um, Luke, but don't tell us his name. Especially don't tell us he's called Jairus and he's the synagogue ruler because he's going to be really easy to find. You just turn up in the town and say, can I please speak to the synagogue ruler? And it's called Jairus. Excuse me, can you tell me this, this story about your daughter and this teacher Jesus? Is that true or not? Oh no, that's not true. That's made up. Excellent. Please come with us to Jerusalem. Let's discredit and end this whole Christian movement now. But again and again and again, they tell us where it happened, who was there, and there's crowds of people, many witnesses, you can look for yourself. Um, one little final argument about names. I quite like this. There's a, um, whoops, excuse me. I got a book here by a guy called um, Richard Balcom, professor in Cambridge, um, called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. It's a defense of the idea that this is real eyewitness history. Um, I love this guy, although like um, some academics, he probably should get out more, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, Richard Backham decides, to, in order to check the credibility of, of sources like this, he will count the names of all the minor characters. So he finds out you know, how many Simons are there. There are eight different Simons, people called Simons. There are six different Josephs, there are five different Judases, five different Johns. He, he counts all the names and then puts them in rank order, to find out the most popular boy's name in the New Testament. The most popular name is Simon, followed by Joseph, followed by Judas, followed by John. The most popular girl's name is Mary. There are six different Marys. He then compares that rank of popularity with names um, in first century Israel um, from reading burial stones and inscriptions on, on boxes of bones. And he says, well, the most popular boy's name, it turns out, in Israel was Simon, followed by Joseph, followed by Lazarus, followed by John, followed by Judas. In other words, the rank order of the names is almost exactly correct. Now, this, uh, you might not appreciate the significance of that yet, this is an extraordinary thing. Because we all know that, that name trends change, don't they? So when I was um, born in 1975, everyone with no imagination called their son Andrew. So I was at, had a class at university, and there were seven of us in the seminar group, and five of us were called Andrew. Right, so that just shows you, 1975, that's what you called your son. Um, nowadays, people are called Liam. No one was called Liam in 1975, so I can work out. In my dad's generation, my dad's called Howard. No one's called Howard now, you see. So name changes just, they don't last very long, and they, they, they change, these trends. Imagine you are making up a novel and setting it in, I don't know, 16th century France and you got to name 200 characters in your epic novel. Well, I mean, you can think of some French names, can't you? There'll be some Pierres and some Jean-Claude's and whatever. But the idea of getting exactly the right number of Pierres in exactly the right ratio to Jean-Claude's by accident, I mean, it's just absolutely impossible, isn't it? You're just not gonna be able to get that right. Unless you're calling people the things that they were actually called because you knew them at the time and you're working out what happened. It's not the story you'd make up. It's not the story that you could make up. And why would you die or be persecuted for a story that you know isn't true? Now, just hear this argument carefully. People do die for things that aren't true. So when a, a terrorist hijacks a, an aeroplane and steers it into a skyscraper, believing that because of that they're going to be welcomed into paradise, that's not true, I think. I don't think they will be welcomed into paradise. But they think it's true, don't they? Otherwise they wouldn't do it. People do die for things that aren't true, but people don't die for things that they know are not true. The, people, the martyrs always believe in their cause. How odd it would be if the people who made this up are then willingly persecuted for the thing that they know that they made up. It doesn't make sense to me. No, but I can understand why if you believe that your king 
died and then burst through death and was raised again. I can imagine you could risk dying for him because you'd reason, well, he came back from the dead, he can get me back from the dead. It's worth the risk. That, that makes sense. If you knew you'd faked it, it'd be inexplicable. So here's the extraordinary thing. Here is a book written by somebody who believed it was true, having interviewed lots and lots of witnesses who believed it was true and recorded their eyewitness testimony. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. I've only been speaking here for about, um, what, 25 minutes. Um, I reckon that most of you already by now have worked out that I am not God. Correct? I, th I think so. I think that's a fair assumption. Um, imagine if instead of just being with you for 25 minutes, I was with you for three years, and at the end of it, you concluded, oh yeah, uh, he's our creator. He made everything. Um, he's going to judge the world. Oh, we're, no, in, we're in no doubt about that at all. In fact, we're so sure about it, we're, we're willing to give our lives to testify to that. Gosh, what on earth would it take to persuade you of that? Well, um, in this book, you'll find out what it was that persuaded these eyewitnesses that they had met God. I think that's worth reading, isn't it? What convinced them? I mean, were they the most gullible people who've ever lived? Or did they have some reasons for what they believed? I just want to look, finally, at some of the things that persuaded them. I wonder if you can turn with me in this little book to page 21. Top of the right-hand uh, page, page 21. John's disciples, that's um, John the Baptist, who was a very famous preacher, a Jewish preacher about the time of Jesus. John the Baptist's disciples told him about some of the things that were going on. Calling two of them to him, he sent them to the Lord, to Jesus, to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect somebody else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. You can see how gullible they were, can't you? Um, why did they trust that Jesus was God from outside? Because of what they'd seen and heard. Well, I think I'd, I'd be slow to accept that one of you was God, but if I walked around with you for three years and every one time you went to a hospital, you emptied the wards by touching people, I start to be suspicious about it. People don't normally do that. If you went to a funeral, you said, oh, no, I don't think it has to end here, and you went to the coffin and opened it and the person got out, I would be pretty scared and surprised. That's the kind of evidence that cumulatively, over years of seeing that with my own eyes, I might just think, you know, maybe you really are God. Tell him what you have seen and heard, and draw your conclusions based on the evidence. That's the advice. Now, just one thing to notice, they don't come with a, a neutral mindset though, they come with an expectation. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect somebody else? In other words, they're expecting someone. And that's quite important because um, John the Baptist, he was a Jewish prophet, he believed that there was a God who made the world, and maybe you don't believe it. He believed that one day God would send his Messiah, his King, into the world. And maybe you don't believe in that. For him the question was, not is there such a thing as a God, is there such a thing as a Messiah? They, they believed yes and yes. Their question was, are you that person? Okay, so they've got an existing Messiah category. They're just trying to match, is, is that you? Now, I don't, we, we come to that and we say, oh, well, there we are. There, there's your problem, you see. They're already biased. They already have presuppositions prior expectations and I just want to reply um, and so are we so are you 
Um, all of us are biased. None of us is neutral. Maybe your presupposition is there is no God, there's not going to be a Messiah. And this is going to really surprise you. Uh, my question is at that point, are you willing even to question your presuppositions? Are you willing to entertain even the possibility that there is a God? If you're not, you know, if, you, if you've got a blind faith in, in atheism that is so absolute that it doesn't even matter what the evidence is, then you, know, you might as well leave. There's nothing I can do to persuade you. But if you're open to the possibility, maybe we're here in this room because somebody put us here, someone made us, there's a future for us beyond it. Uh, there's a reason why we live here. There's a God who wants to know us. Maybe, I'm not saying accept that, I'm saying accept that as a possibility. Well then the question is, could this man in history be that God? Does he fit that shape? I used to think, oh they're biased. Because they believe in a God, they're more gullible. I'm not so sure it's how it works actually. I think for a Jewish person who believes in a God who is the creator of everything and the one who is supremely powerful above the heavens, for someone like that to believe that an ordinary Jewish carpenter is that God, I think is almost more difficult for them than for us. It's a real category problem, right? We know there is a God, but how can it be you? We know there is a God, but you've just been executed on a cross. They've got big things to, you know, to get past. In the end, it's the evidence of what they see that persuades them. Uh, this really is God. One um, final, final, final thing before we stop, and then you can ask me questions. Um, sometimes I think that our view of God is that he's hiding. Now, why has he made it so difficult? Here we are in this room, we're looking everywhere for the answers, we can't find them. Um, that's why we come here to this big questions event. Why is God being so sneaky, so difficult to find? Um, and there's just a, a little story that Jesus tells in the mid, right in the middle of this book. I just want to read it just to challenge us. Um, it's a, there's actually three little stories all about lost things that get found. Now, I can really relate to this because, you know, barely a day goes by when I don't lose my house keys and my passport or, you know, whatever. Anyway, I can relate to this kind of story. Jesus says this. Tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus, popular with them. But the Pharisees, the religious people, the teachers of the law, muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable, this story. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and say, says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? In those days, a coin wasn't like 10p, it was like a you know, 50 pound note. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus says, um, not only has God stepped through the door of history, but God's going looking for people. See, we think that we're the ones who are looking, God's the one who's hiding, and Jesus says, no, it's not that way around. Um, I'm the one who's looking. You're the ones who are hiding. And I, I want to just confess at the end of this little talk that that was, that was certainly me at university. I, I began to look into these things. I met some Christians who explained some of these things to me. I started to realise that here's a, a document with real historical credibility. Here are events that I can really know about for sure. All sorts of eyewitnesses. I thought, you know, this guy Jesus, he seems pretty persuasive. I mean, people who saw him were convinced, and they ought to know. They know if he healed a blind man or not, or if he was alive or not. It's probably true, you know. It's probably true. And you might think, well, the, the logical thing to do would be become a Christian then. Got convinced it's true, so start following him. But I didn't do that at university because I didn't want it to be true. And so I hid but at arm's length, avoided coming to talks like this. I used to get invited. Maybe you're here because your Christian neighbour has just invited you so many times it became embarrassing not to accept. But I tried everything I could to avoid having to come. 
Uh, not because I thought it was rubbish, but because I was afraid it wasn't rubbish. And I was hiding. I didn't want it to mess up my life. And I can testify that God was persistent. He's come through the door of history and he's gone looking for you. Maybe that's why you're here tonight. Maybe God wants you to take this seriously and to start thinking about it, to start looking into the evidence. Maybe he's after you. Maybe he wants to find you if you'll turn back to him. A um, little plea, I, I, my, as I say, my aim at the beginning was I want to persuade you to read this book. If that's all I've done tonight, I'm really happy with that. I'm not saying believe it because I said so. I'm saying look into it because I said so. I hope I've persuaded you at least it's worth doing that. And what I want to suggest, though, is rather than reading it quickly, I mean, it's not very long, you could probably read it in two and a half hours, I guess, but don't read it in two and a half hours. Instead, read chapter one and take a whole hour over it. That's my suggestion. It's just um, three or four pages. Read it slowly enough to actually think about what's being said. And maybe you could annotate it. My suggestion, often to friends, is why don't you read it? Underline anything that um, you don't understand tick anything you agree with and put a cross next to anything you don't agree with and then get a Christian friend to buy you a coffee, which they will do, I'm promising on their behalf, and go through your annotations. Right? So, so I've, I've read chapter one, I thought it was worth a try and I got some questions, I didn't like this bit, I like this bit and I didn't understand this. Can you, can you shed any light on it? And maybe the Christian friend can or maybe they don't understand either, but you have a discussion and if that's useful and beneficial, then you do the same thing with chapter two and then they buy you another coffee. This is a good book, it's 24 copies, right? It's so better even than a loyalty card from Starbucks. Right? Um, if it stops being useful, you say, look, thanks, but I'm not interested anymore. So all you've got to lose is one hour of your life plus a free coffee and a bit of annotating. Why not try that? Who knows? Maybe you find it interesting enough to do chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. Maybe you find the evidence is compelling. Maybe you find that you can be certain. Maybe you find that God is going looking for you and wants to find you. Thanks so much for listening. I'm going to hand back over to Barnaby.